Military Medicine and War Docs present a Ready Medical Force Special Collection. We speak with the authors of recently accepted journal articles addressing the key readiness issues in operational medicine and discuss the importance of their findings. Welcome to War Docs, the military medicine podcast. This show brings you a first-hand, behind-the-scenes look into the mission, unique opportunities, and deployed experiences of the entire military healthcare team. From state-of-the-art hospitals in the United States to the most austere environments across the globe, War Docs has you covered. Welcome to War Docs. I'm your host, Major General Retired Jeff Clark, and today's guest is U.S. Air Force Colonel Dr. Joe Madry. Colonel Madry is a lead author on the November 2023 uh, edition of the AMSIS Journal Military Medicine. Uh, his article is entitled Management of Combat Casualty Aeromedical Evacuation from a, a Roll 2 to a Roll 3 Medical Facility. Joe, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation, General Clark. Uh, I really enjoy this podcast and appreciate the opportunity to contribute. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. So, Joe, why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about your background, how you came to uh, join our Air Force, and what you're doing now. So, uh, I went to the Air Force Academy, graduated in 2001. From there, I was uh, sent to Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, as a bioenvironmental engineer for three years. Got into the Uniformed Services University for medical school, graduated there in 2008, uh, I knew from very early on that I really liked the variety and the acuity that emergency medicine offered. So I did an emergency medicine residency at Brook Army Medical Center. From there, I went to Denver to do a medical toxicology fellowship. After finishing that fellowship, they sent me back to BMC to be core faculty there for a few years. And then I became director of the NROUTE Care Research Center for five years and then deputy commander of the then U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research. We had that job for three years and then got uh, PCA back to BAMC. And just this last December, I took over as the chief of the BAMC Department of Clinical Investigation. You've had a great career so far, and you're continuing to have one. So thank you. thanks for what you're doing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your co-authors and what led you all to do this research, and specifically, um, what question were you trying to answer? Sure. Uh, so the co-authors were uh, the current director, Major Tyler Davis, the director of the Enroute Care Research Center, that is, the former director, Major Patrick N.G., uh, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Schauer, our statistician, Allison Arana, our data analyst, Alex Mora, and then our research coordinator, Laura Reeves. Finally, our three research nurses, Julie Cutright, Joni Passasio, and Crystal Perez. Uh, with regards to the reason for this study, so as you're aware, during Operation During Freedom, Secretary Gates established the golden hour rule requiring that patients be evacuated to a facility within one hour of the point mm -hmm. of injury. This resulted in rapid evacuation for damage control, resuscitation, and surgery at facilities that were dispersed uh, throughout the country. As a result, patients were being evacuated from roll two to roll through three facilities on ventilators with wound vacs, infusion pumps, uh, chest tubes, other interventions that were not typically used to in the standard medevac patient. Those patients were transported by both Army medevac helicopters as well as Air Force critical care air transport teams. In part, that was determined first the facility had to have an airfield if Air Force CCAT was going to come in. Uh, there were a few times where Air Force CCAT was put on Army medevac helicopters um, or then the patient, depending on the patient's acuity, which team was uh, mustered to evacuate that patient from the roll two to roll three. So with that in mind, the objective of this study was to describe the care provided in patients during in-theater inter-facility transports, and then compare those patient characteristics and management of those patients to the ones that we had published in a previous study, which was looking at the point of injury to MTF evacuations. You obviously you had a great team and and the question what you were researching is incredibly incredibly important tell us a little bit about the methodology of your study how you tried to answer that question sure uh, we conducted a retrospective review of medical records of US military US government contractors and US contractors who were treated at a roll 2 facility and subsequently evacuated to a roll 3 facility in either Iraq or Afghanistan 
from January 2007 until December of 2016. We excluded patients under the age of 18, detainees, and those who died before departing the Rule 2 facility. We created the DOD Trauma Registry, referred to as the daughter, uh, for to identify patients that met our inclusion criteria. And then we obtained those med- patients' records from Medivac or CCAT patient care records that came from the Joint Trauma System or the CCAT pilot unit, respectively. We also created the Joint Trauma System Role 2 database to determine the procedures performed at the Role 2 facility and then obtained outcome data from the daughter. That's a pretty impressive methodology. It was a lot of work. Thank goodness for the a DOD trauma registry and the assets that you had available to you, but I'm, I'm sure you and your team spent a whole lot of time going through all of that and pulling all that together. Can you summarize summarize your results for us? Yeah, we analyzed data from 869 patients. The mean flight time from the roll two to the roll three was 39 minutes versus 23 minutes in the point of injury group. Most Roll 2 to Roll 3 transport were staffed by advanced providers, be that nurses, PAs, or physicians with a medic supporting. In contrast, the flights from the point of injury cohort were primarily staffed by medics and paramedics. Uh, Of the Roll 2 to 3 transfers, approximately half were transported by aeromedical evacuation, uh, which is the Air Force's non-critical care air evacuation component, one quarter by critical care air transport teams, and then one quarter by medevac teams. During the transport from the point of injury, most procedures were related to damage control resuscitation, such as uh, fluids, blood administration, hemorrhage control, and hypothermia prevention. As one would expect, patients leaving the Roll 2 facility frequently had received more critical interventions, such as intubation, mechanical ventilation, fluid and blood administration, laparotomy, fasciotomy, and amputation. During the interfacility transfer flights, patients were more likely to require ventilator management and receive medications. Pain and cardiac arrest were more commonly documented in the point of injury evacuations compared to the Roll 2 and Roll 3. Conversely, respiratory events, hemodynamic events, neurologic events, and equipment failure were more common during the Roll 2 to Roll 3 evacuations. Survival rates were slightly higher among the Roll 2 to Roll 3 cohort compared to the point of injury cohort. which is kind of to be expected in that more critical patients are more likely to expire sooner. The longer you get from the time of injury, the higher more your survival rate becomes. That's amazing information of, of immense value for a variety of things to include. How do you train folks that are going to be involved in that first leg of transportation? And then how do you train folks to make sure they've got the right training and equipment for two to three? So, Could you, so what conclusions did you and your team come to and and what are the implications for uh, combat casualty care in future conflicts? The first big takeaway from our study was that the Roll 2 to Roll 3 transport were significantly longer in duration due to the dispersal of the Roll 2s close to combat operations per Secretary Gates' golden hour policy. Second, the majority of patient care teams included an advanced medical provider, be that a physician, PA, or nurse. Third, those intrafacility and route care personnel had to manage mechanical ventilators, medication infusions, paralytics, chest tubes, and other advanced medical equipment and procedures outside of the standard medic scope of practice. Fourth, patients were more likely to have documented respiratory, hemodynamic, and neurologic events, as well as equipment failure during transport. So these are all things to think about for future operations. How do we plan to address these? Based on these findings, the current events in Ukraine and the Pacific, the threat of a lack of air security already in future conflicts, I think we need to consider how we are going to manage large volumes of post-operative patients requiring transportation. Uh, Currently, to the best of my knowledge, no such standard capability exists. While the Army clearly demonstrated in OIF, OEF, its ability to task nurses, PAs, and physicians to support the intra-facility transfer mission, to my knowledge, there is no Army physician or nurse-led teams undergoing routine training for such a mission. As a CCAT doc myself, I can confirm there have been discussions of using Air Force CCATs on the ground. There have been training missions where they've been put on ships. Uh, but it has yet to been incorporated into doctrine or training for CCAT teams. 
There's also currently no ground transportation platform that provides the electrical power, oxygen, and other capabilities necessary to manage larger numbers of patients like we can do in a C-130, C-17, and other military aircraft. Alternatively, the military is considering and researching how skills required of a medic may be significantly ex expanded to include these more advanced skills, as well as research and developing technology to bridge that gap, such as automated ventilators, telemedicine, decision support technologies, et cetera. Like one example I experienced personally in Afghanistan uh, was the Air Force PJ team uh, was sent out to do an intra-facility transfer and they brought back a patient and they were begging the patient and the patient was stable, but the the PJ pararescueman had been bagging the patient for an hour during transport because he couldn't figure out how to work the ventilator. Um, you know, right. at some point he had probably received some training on that, but it's just not something they do on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. How do we kind of bridge that gap with some of this technology? So in summary, our overall conclusion from our results is that when compared to medevac, medevac transports from the point of injury in theater, interfacility transports from roll two to roll three are longer in duration, of higher complexity and utilize more advanced level providers to provide that care. So right. accordingly, military medical planning, training and resource allocation consider these should consider these factors to include increasing the number of medical personnel trained in interfacility patient transportation while preparing for future military operations. Yeah, Joe, that's amazing. Thank you very much for doing that research. I think it's important that our senior leaders in the military health system read your article, or, uh, perhaps our, also listen or watch this war doc so that they uh, can use the information you and your you and your team um, have provided. And we I thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much. And so our war doc's guest has been Colonel Joe Madry. I encourage our listeners to read. Uh, his outstanding article, Management of Combat Casualties During Air Medical Evacuation from a Roll 2 to a Roll 3 Medical Facility, is in the November 2023 edition of Military Medicine. If you're already a member of AMSIS, you have access, easy access to this article and any of the articles, great articles that Military Medicine uh, uh, provides. Uh, if you're not a member of AMSIS, I encourage you to, to join. It's a great organization and you get you get, you get access to military medicine and articles like Colonel Madry just, just shared with us. Um, Colonel Madry, again, I thank you very much for your research. It's critical research. It's very important. We, we need to pay attention to the lessons that, that, that you provide. Uh, and I thank you for taking the time and effort to, to do all the work involved and to publish in military medicine. We thank you for joining War Docs, the military medicine uh, podcast, and we thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you, General Clark. It was an absolute pleasure. I would like to give a shout out to the Joint Trauma System and the CCAP Pilot Unit for providing us the data necessary for this study. And I'd also like to thank you for hosting me and for the podcast and for all the great lessons I have learned from the War Docs interviews. Yeah, Joe, thanks. And thanks for that shout out both to the Joint Trauma System and the registry there and, and to War Docs. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. May God bless. Thank you for listening to War Docs. We sure hope you enjoyed it. War Docs is a nonprofit organization supported by donations from listeners like you. Please follow and subscribe to our show on whatever platform you consume your podcasts and rate and review this episode and share the show with your contacts on social media. Find out more information about our show, our guests, and how to become a member of Team War Docs on wardocspodcast.com. Thank you for your support. If you like war stories and medical drama, War Docs has you covered. Spread the word.